So we'll do that now. All right, double checking in the events here. In one place it tells me that we're live and in another it does not. So good, I see it. Fantastic. All right, hello everybody. Thanks for, hello Joanne. Nice to have you here today. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for sticking with me while I'm trying to figure out this live stream from Zoom. Never done it before. Um, good to be with you today. I'm going to jump right into uh, my disclaimer, which is the most important part of this live stream. Just kidding. But <clears throat> it is for purposes of my industry. So let me pull that up here and read it out loud. All right, we're going to be talking about the five headwinds that face the modern woman's retirement, but just remember that this live stream is for education purposes only. Specific tax, legal, or investment advice is not offered on this. So before considering acting on anything that you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal, or investment advisor. And remember that securities are offered through the Kestra Investment Services LLC, member of FINRA SIPSI, uh, <clears throat> and my investment advisory services are offered through Kestra Advisory Services which are not affiliated with Pleasant Wealth. And of course you can read the rest of that and you can screenshot that um, web address if you want to look at further legal disclosures. All right, so really glad that you're here today. And what our plan is for today is to talk about the five headwinds that face the modern woman's retirement. And <clears throat> I did this live stream on Andy Panko's uh, taxes and retirement with some pretty good feedback, also some areas where we could have added more information. And so that's what I wanted to offer on this live stream today. So in order to dive right in, get you up to speed, if you haven't seen that, seen that interview, we're going to start with the five headwinds. So for women, um, we have just by the nature of who we are and our lifespan, the things that we face in retirement are different from our male counterparts. So throughout our working career, we are paid 80% of what our male counterparts are paid. And you've heard that statistic before, likely it's kind of, you know, ruffled a couple of feathers here or there. But um, what I see as a retirement planner is the ripple effect that that has. So if I am paid 80% less in my day-to-day -day paycheck, I am earning less, my cash flow is less, I'm able to spend less, but also uh, the taxes that are going towards social security that give me that social security pension are going to be 80% less. Um, and for any benefits that I might receive from an employer, whether that's a 401k match or a profit sharing contribution is going to be 80% less. And so not only does it impact my day-to-day -day living, but it also impacts the future income that I could have in retirement. The second headwind that women face is that we typically have employment gaps in the way that we have approached employment. Um, as society really puts a lot of pressure on women to be caregivers and we're kind of accustomed to it. I mean, it's, it's a generational um, pressure. And so we're accustomed to being a caregiver and therefore we might step out of the workforce for caring for children. We might step out of the workforce to, um, care for an ailing parent or even if our spouse is uh, sick. And so it's pretty common for women to step out of the workforce and do so happily, sometimes not happily, but sometimes quite often happily and enjoying that aspect of being a caregiver. And what that can do, of course, is less cash flow in the day to day. So if I'm not working, I'm not making income, but it also means less cash flow in the future. So that's less money going towards Social Security and therefore less benefit received by Social Security, as well as those pensions, those 401ks, the profit sharing, all of those will be reduced because of that gap of employment. And furthermore, when women are stepping in and out of the workforce, often when they step back into the workforce, they're paid again at a lower rate than if they would have stayed in that whole time and had that upward trajectory of their income. And so again, that's another piece of the puzzle when we step out of the workforce. The third headwind is that women invest too conservatively. Now it's not across the board, but women just tend to not want to take as much risk with their investments. And 
I don't really know the psychology behind it, but I do see it so repeatedly when I'm in a 401k conversation where I'm enrolling participants and a woman um, is unfamiliar and so she sticks with what is familiar. Well, I am familiar with a bank account. Do I have that option? Well, not really, but you can use this money market account. Okay, that's what I wanna do and it feels safe. And so that deferring to what feels safe or what feels comfortable um, can often lead to women not having the same accrued amount of portfolios in their retirement because they haven't taken the risk necessary. They haven't had enough exposure to stocks throughout their lifetime um, to really grow their portfolio. And on that, I just want to say that um, one reason is that as women, you know, we like to have conversations with other women often. And when it comes to investments, there's so much lingo that's involved with um, investment planning. And so uh, if, if women are not talking about investments or the investment planning, then they cannot necessarily understand the risk that they would be open to taking on in the future or in their present portfolio that helps shape their future. So that might be one little element there. Now, I'm going to pause right here and let you know I am at the office and it's a little bit stir crazy today. We have one of the companies that has been sharing space with us for a period of time. They're going virtual and so they're moving out. You might end up seeing somebody in the back of my screen. I might get interrupted. I don't know. We'll just see how this unfolds. But um, yes, with that, we'll dive into item number four. So this is the pink tax. And Pink tax is one that kind of sets me on fire because it's it's not an actual tax. It's not something that's formal. It's just embedded within the pricing of goods and services. And that is that women tend to pay more for the average good or service than our male counterparts. And as I think about that and think about why that could be, I have a husband that um, has a career in supply chain. And so one time we were talking about this and he's like, well, you know, um, cause I was, I was referencing a toolkit that one of my coworkers has that's cute pink, you know, right size for a woman, but was like, I don't know, 10 or 12 bucks more than a typical tool set of equivalent, um, amount. And he said, yeah, you know, well with supply chain, that is an anomaly like that, that offering it, that pink toolbox is, a, is an anomaly that the suppliers have to then create, find the, all of the, the sources for it. And so it is a higher cost to businesses. And so as I thought about that, I thought, okay, okay, well, it looks like this money system thing was set up by men. And with women not being at the table as the money, different money systems are set up, whether it's goods or services and the pricing they're in, or just really like social security, how pensions work, how 401ks work, the legal, all of that. If women were not sitting at the table, well, it kind of um, set us up to have these five headwinds. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but yes, pink tax is that women spend more money on goods and service, goods and services than our male counterparts. And what I'd be curious to hear from you as you are watching is, um, just what goods and services you've noticed that you spend more than the male counterpart. So um, some examples that I thought of, of course, was this little toolkit, excuse me, that um, my one coworker had, but razors, you know, you can get a blue razor or you can get a pink razor. They both shave, but the pink one costs more. Um, someone had commented that dry cleaning is often a uh, more expensive for women with the types of clothing that we have. Um, oil changes, diapers, clothing, just in general. Like if you are shopping for a toddler boy and a toddler girl, the toddler girl's clothing is going to be more expensive. All right. So yeah, I'm really curious what it is that you have seen with, with that. Um, and I am checking on the comments every now and then. So if you end up having a, a question, there will be a time for question and answer. I've gathered a couple questions ahead of time, but I'm really interested to answer what it is that you were hoping to get out of this conversation. So that leads me to headwind number five, which is that women live longer than our male counterparts. And I always love pulling out this statistic because, um, especially with financial planners, because we, because of our software, we think that the average age is longer typically than what has been researched, but 
um, you know, health, health stuff is increasing, uh, medical, medical care is bettering. And so our lifespans are increasing, but from the statistic that I read, men live an average age of 76 and women live an average age of 81. So that's an extra five years of retirement that we have to save for and spend through with that nest egg that we have built up. And we need to have more money saved up long term. So if I can just go back through these five and reframe them from the perspective that I see as a financial planner. Women are paid less, 80% of what our male counterparts are. Therefore, we have less money today and less money in the future through our 401ks and pensions. And then I'm going to skip. Then we got that pink tax. So we're spending more today and we're going to be spending more in the future on goods and services that we spend. So that means our capacity for savings is less. We step out of the workforce periodically, and that can not only decrease the amount that we have the ability to save for in the present, but it also reduces future savings. It also re reduces the amount of income that we might be earning in a given year. Um, as we step back into the workforce, uh, we get paid less. And then, so all of that, yet we invest too conservatively. We're not willing to take on the same stock market risk because we haven't had the conversation and don't have the comfort. Therefore, we are required to save more. But oh yeah, we're paid less and we're spending more on goods and services. So that wiggle room to, to save more is really not as present. And finally, we live longer. And therefore, the planning needs that we have are more extensive. We have to be more uh, careful with the money that we have saved long term. So that's the five headwinds. Curious which of those resonates the most with you as like maybe the experience that you've had. You're welcome to comment that um, in the comment section. Or um, if there's any of these that stick out that's just kind of confusing. Or anything you need clarity on. But as, as I thought, thought about it is like these headwinds that we have are because there weren't as many women sitting at the table, if any, um, during legislative conversations where some of these structures were put in place. And so the tides, of course, are turning. There are more women in, um, in those legal seats and helping with that legislation being pushed through and helping scope through that. Women are in the workforce and women are shaping the way that we buy and sell goods. And there was a statistic put out that by McKinsey, I believe, and I will link this below, but um, stating that by 2030, women will control two thirds of the nation's wealth. So control is different from hold, but it's, it's the spending power. And what I see is that the spending decisions really are turning, they're changing. And especially for women as we're, as stepping towards retirement, um, having to make those decisions on the investments and what it is that you need to make sure that your life is covered and um, that you have the income that you need at the time that you need it, you have the advice that you need at the time that you need it, et cetera. We are demanding more from financial services specifically, which I love. Um, because women are not as fluid about talking about money as our male counterparts, we are like trying to play catch up with what does this mean? What is an IRA versus a 401k versus a Roth? What is an RMD or a QCD? These words that these that we're around when we're in a financial meeting, they get really overwhelming because it's just jargon and it does mean something. We do have to learn it at some point um, or partner with someone that we feel really comfortable with to help us through those decision making. But um, yeah, women step to the financial conversation and are requesting different conversation. They do not want the typical, tell me about the portfolio, tell me about how risky or conservative this is, tell me how it compares against its competitors. I often see women just check out of that at that point. And for good reason, because yes, that matters. Investment management matters. But more importantly, and especially, I mean, this is the perspective I bring as a financial planner, is that 
women need to connect money to real life. And so if we can have the conversations, look through the lens of, you know, a family member that's going through some sort of issue and ask the questions of how are you sorting through that? How are you prioritizing the decision making for your finances? Then it becomes real. So if I can get a woman to just start talking about life and talking about some of the decision making that she's having, then I can connect it back to the portfolio. And oftentimes what I see in meetings is that women feel timid going into that financial planner meeting because she thinks that I'm supposed to uh, be very fluent in portfolio talk. And I disagree. And I think it's so important for us to bring the questions of like, okay, I've got this portfolio, you've got this 401k, fantastic. How does that connect with my kids going to college? Oh, it doesn't? Oh, okay. Well, okay, after my kids are in college, then do I grow it? Like we can, we can use the family timeline, which we're pretty uh, more, a lot more comfortable with to help us shape that financial conversation. And that's why I wanted to open up for question and answer. I'm gonna check back here to see the questions. Hi, Paula, thanks for being with me today. Dry cleaning, yes. All right, let me look at a couple of these. I think we may be taken advantage of when buying items that require negotiation, both our fault and that of the salespeople. Case in point, car purchases. Yes, <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable negotiating a car purchase. I would rather send a liaison, at this point it's my husband, to go and have that negotiation so that um, I don't have to try to whittle down the price. Um, but that also presents opportunity. like. There are going to be many more women buying cars on their own because we now have, you have more of a track record of women earning a paycheck and therefore stepping into retirement, kind of owning the money. And I can talk about that more in just a little bit. But when you own the money and you own the money decision, then you will demand different services. And so what we will see is happening, what we will see happen is that each industry is going to have some sort of disruption a new way of presenting information, a new way of selling that um, is not to the, to the, what's the word I need? I lose words sometimes, um, is not to our disadvantage. So I'm excited to see what happens with industries as they start innovating and really serving the need of the woman. Um, and because women are going to be controlling two thirds of the nation's wealth by 2030, according to that statistic from McKinsey, um, the tide, like money speaks, money is power, money makes changes. And so I do think that we'll be seeing that soon. Um, all right, longevity risk is a great concern to me. Financially, the future is so unsure. Longevity risk, yes. So one, just one element that I, we kind of touched on in that live stream with, with Andy, um, but didn't quite scratch the itch fully is this concern of longevity and what that means for women. Um, and I started into it, but I think it kind of dovetailed one direction. So I think the mo one of the most pivotal decisions that a woman makes is how she takes her social security or her pension. And because that is the bedrock of the retiree's income for retirement. And if we can get that, that bedrock of income as stable as possible, as high as possible, then she will be set up for success much better. Um, so that might mean, you know, if we have stepped out of the workforce for a couple of years, it might mean that our retirement date is later. It might mean that it's 70, not 65, um, which isn't fun to hear, but also you know, work can look different for different people. You don't have to stay in the one track record. You can reimagine yourself um, in a new career. So uh, I, I hope you don't feel constrained by that, that comment of like, maybe women just need to be working longer in the workforce because we have taken time out of the, the workforce to care for people. Um, but that also begs to say like, Who's, who's to say that we are absolutely the best caregivers? What if we just empower our male counterparts, if you're in a marriage or if you have children, um, that somebody else is stepping up to the table for those care needs if we really need to get so many years in with um, state teachers in order to be able to get our pension and to get it as high as we need it to be? 
our financial needs are just as important as somebody else's care needs. And maybe we don't have to be the ones to always default to caregiving. So um, not always popular conversation to have, but I think it's important um, that we do have a choice. And I'm going to continue on with some of these questions. So that idea of longevity, yes, we need to start with our baseline pension-like income from Social Security or STRS, or um, if you do still have a pension, the way that you claim that. And I am interested to know if having a specific Social Security training for women would be of interest to you. I have offered it in the past and I wasn't quite sure that it necessarily was going to land, but you know, we've got a new client or not client base. We have a new viewer base here that's more retirement oriented. And that is really a conversation I love to have kind of the nuances to claiming specifically from the lens of a woman, um, whether you are coupled or whether you are single or um, you have become divorced or widowed, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, so that base is important. Um, utilizing those last years in retire in your career to really hyper save and make up for lost time is super important for a woman, um, especially when those kids are out of college and you're not maybe paying for that anymore or you've paid down your mortgage. Increasing the amount that you're sending to your retirement so that you can make up for that lost time is very important. Um, and with that caregiving, I think women tend to put our needs last. And we always use the phrase, like, put your mask on first, like in a in an airplane, you hear that. But with money, we have to be very careful and save that extra amount and really make up for the lost time because women don't necessarily want, like most people that I talk to don't want to be a burden on their children, don't want to have um, somebody have to care for them. They want to be financially independent. But what that means is that you have to sacrifice in those higher earning years between maybe age 50 and 65 or 55 and 70, where you're really ramping up those savings. So this is, this is your notice. If you are ready to get started additionally saving, here's your sign. You can, you can move forward with that. Okay. And questions. I have them here that I, I gathered from you guys and I am in a very hot room. So I'm going to Take out my sweater here. Hope you don't mind. Okay, so this is a, a fairly um, specific question, but recognizing I don't know a lot of the context of this, even with the detail given. So this is not formal advice, just my thoughts based on the information I have. So it says, assuming a widowed, divorced single woman has all other debts paid off by age 50, is it ever a good idea, financial idea, to prioritize paying off the mortgage early, say before age 55? Or is it better to increase retirement investments by 50 and not pay off the mortgage early? So some of this is going to, I, I like this question because it's, this really gets into um, two elements. Of course, there's the, the number side of things, what makes most sense financially. And from that perspective, I would encourage continuing the mortgage as is and not over emphasizing it. Um, I would much rather personally see uh, more money going towards the that retirement account, boosting those nest eggs. The reason is that a mortgage, let's say you have 4% that you're paying in interest on your mortgage. That's static. That payment stays static. It's not like it increases over time, assuming you don't have a, a flexible interest rate mortgage. But um, so if that's staying static, your cost of living is increasing, it continues growing, um, and investments have the opportunity to keep growing. And so I would much rather put it towards something that's growing, the needs of the future, um, rather than paying off the mortgage in the present. But I always talk about competing demands. We always have competing demands with money. You can, uh, and they feel in opposition of each other. So in this scenario of paying off debt or putting money towards retirement, my future or my present strain. <laughs> and sometimes this just comes down to personal preference. If you are losing sleep over your um, debt that you have, it's a good idea to put more emphasis towards there because our quality of life is important. However, 
as, as we look towards the future, our future quality of life is also important. And so if you're finding yourself in between those kind of stuck between wanting to pay off a mortgage, wanting to put money towards the future, split the difference if you need to, um, if then you can kind of get both accomplished over time, but don't miss saving towards your future. Okay. My husband is more than 10 years older than I am and will soon be 65. Since I will likely have several years of singlehood, would you recommend that I look into an annuity to cover basic expenses for those years? Other thoughts? I will have a small pension, two thirds of his pension, social security, and besides income from investments. I've done computation or calculations of, and know that the guaranteed income sources I will have I have will not cover my basic expenses. So I feel that I will be less stressed over the next several years if I do not have to depend on the investments. I'm going to read that again because I think I read that wrong. I've done the calculations and know that my guaranteed income sources will not cover my basic expenses. I feel that I will be less stressed over the next several years if I do not have to depend on the investments. But do I really have a choice? So the question is, do I recommend to annuity? So um, depending on what the size of the investments are, you may or may not want to put money towards an annuity. Yes, it is nice to have um, all of our basic expenses covered by a set pension that we can't outlive. So whether that's Social Security or an additional pension or your self-created pension, which is an annuity. Um, however, you also need to have liquid money. Um, I have seen so many scenarios of women specifically uh, of being over annuitied and annuities create such a good purpose for a bedrock of income, but you have to lock up money to do it. And so if I would want to make sure, and again, not knowing really any of your numbers and check with your investment advisor on this, but uh, that you have enough liquid just in case of the other needs that might come up, you might come across. I would be slow to lock up too much money into an annuity. So I hope that addresses that question. Okay. This is a comment and then a question. So every month I have an aha moment, learning something significant that has made me pause. I was thinking of making a list because nobody tells you some of these things unless you ask. Yes. Uh, the latest is how difficult it is to get a mortgage if you've already stopped working and have no consistent source of income other than through an IRA withdrawal. You can Google this and find articles. I've also asked the question to two mortgage brokers. Um, one said, no, you can't do it. And I can't get a mortgage at all. And the second said that I can get a mortgage by making three IRA withdrawals for three months. And I have enough money to sustain this for three years. Um, so she's asking, do I just pay cash for the new home or can I, can I please leverage debt? You know, what are the options? This is mortgage uh, lender to mortgage lender specific because some will just not allow it. Uh, I have had clients who in their retirement years have taken IRA withdrawals in order to create the income to show for um, what's needed to show for those mortgages. It's so like what you're saying here is essentially it's like, it's funny that I might have this large resource of investments that I really don't want to tap but because I don't have income in the way that they want to see income, I am not able to get a mortgage, even though you could easily back it up with the investment. So it depends from mortgage lender to mortgage lender. And I'm inviting all the mortgage lenders that are within this group to comment specifically on this question um, and just give your two cents on that. So I think it there are options available. Um, okay. Do you recommend long-term care or self-funding? I don't recommend either over the other. It really depends on where your assets are. So how much money you have saved over time. There's kind of a window for when it makes sense to purchase long-term care insurance. And if you have, and it's not hard and fast, but it's kind of like, it, it really, it comes down to um, like the middle-class person is right in the zone of maybe needing to purchase long-term care and maybe being able to to afford it because it's fairly expensive. So when someone has a couple million dollars of assets, they're probably going to be able to self-fund. If someone has under $500,000 of assets, they probably are going to have to, like insurance is going to be too expensive and they're still going to have to self-insure. 
um, which means basically just spend down their assets. Um, a lot of people get into a bind about why they might have to spend through their assets that they saved in order to use money for the nursing home. From my perspective, like I, that's the point of saving so that we can care for these types of things so, so we're not a burden on somebody else. Um, and so it doesn't bother me as much, but depending on what your desires are to pass money to the next generation, um, long-term care insurance is definitely a buffer there that would help you be able to pass more money on. Okay, and the next question basically dovetails right into that. What about the possible propensity by women in general to worry about providing a legacy for their adult children. And I'm wondering if this was possibly in comment, in commentary with um, the headwinds as a possible headwind that we face. And yes, that ties right back into that caregiver need. Um, women don't have a history of asking for what they need or um, saving money for themselves. They always do it from the lens of the family. And so, yeah, you might have the desire to pass money on to your children. That's not a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing either. So it's just, a, it comes down to what you want. So if you really at your core want to send money to your children, make it as part of your plan. If it's not really that much of a desire, but there's like this should attached to it, maybe reconsider why that should is there. Why is it that you might need to send money to your children? Um, just something to stew on there. I think that gets into our money mindset a little bit. Um, let's scroll here. Okay. Can you expand on a woman's tendency to be risk averse and how you might address that with her in a conversation? Um, how I address this is kind of twofold. One, I am trying to understand what makes her risk averse. If it is a lack of financial literacy, where she's just not familiar with the terms, kind of seems hesitant because she's never done it before. I usually try some sort of stepped in approach to getting to her to where she to where she needs to be. So whether that's okay, let's have the bulk of the money, you know, 50% invested conservatively the way that you want. What if we did the other 50% and invested it the way that someone your age might I'm going to use the word should and I feel bad because I just used the word should um, as, as a negative, but um, what's typical for, for someone your age and with the lifespan that you have. Um, and if we can maybe do both of those in tandem, at least that'll stretch her a little bit farther. Um, the other parts that I talk about are, you know, if we break down what stocks and bonds actually are, two things that you can do with money. You can either own a company, that's a stock, or you lend money to a company, that's a bond. And ownership, if, if you can make it uh, tangible. So here in Canton, Ohio, we have a couple of publicly traded companies, Timken being the most popular, Diebold being another one. Um, if you can tie it back to something that she knows, that kind of helps further her comfort level with it. So that's a financial literacy thing. Other people do know plenty about investments and still just don't want to invest more aggressively. And then I'm talking about what the trade-offs are for going more conservatively. If you have that, if, if you invest more conservatively, your accounts might be here. This means this to your income. This is a $2,000 swing to your income. If you're not investing the way that you should, I think if you can tie it back to something tangible today that she understands cash flow, or, you know, publicly traded companies locally and how they would work and how you would actually gain money from being part owner of them, then it expands her comfort level with it. So just some thoughts from me. Um, what do you think of 55 plus retirement communities? This is fascinating to me. I have heard so many, I, I know that's like a formal community and I'm actually gonna go slightly different direction. I have heard so many comments from women lately of stepping into retirement and being single and wondering if she's going to end up in a home, not, not like a nursing home, in a, um, like a community home with her friends. So they're all kind of talking about what it would mean to, to live together because it would kind of be fun. You'd have the companionship. Um, 
and also be able to afford the living situation. You might not necessarily have the, the rent needed or I'm sorry, not the rent, the, uh, the debt, the mortgage that you'd have to pay on it. So you've got maybe one friend that has the means to buy the home and everybody else pays the rent to that friend. It's kind of a win-win all around. I really love that idea because I know women are such connectors. We really like to be in community with, the, with our friends. Um, and I think that's just a fun way of entering retirement. So um, 55 plus communities, I don't really have a formal opinion on them. They seem fine. Uh, and if it suits you, great. If you like the variety of age, um, my aunt and uncle just recently moved to a community that's intended to be different generations, all in one place, sharing sharing um, a certain amount of land, and then there's different homes, and they can you know go and visit each other. I think that's neat. I think um, if we get too locked into our own generation, sometimes we miss all that's good about other generations. And then that can get us kind of locked into those um, black and white uh, arguments that might not necessarily need to be there. If we had a little bit more understanding about people. All right, I'm gonna go check on the live stream. So those were some that I gathered beforehand. Oh, Joanne, thank you. Yes, Social Security. I would love to have that conversation. I love talking about Social Security, so um, yes. How about single ladies and planning to possibly do discussion? Okay, Mary Kessler asked the question about single ladies planning for the possible long-term care, nursing home, protect your assets conundrum for discussion. And I did touch on that a little bit. The other, um, there, yeah, and actually, I think I've, I've covered that enough. I'm not going to go the direction I was going to go. And I'll leave a little bit more time for any more questions. I'm going to go back to the ones that I gathered beforehand just to see if there's any other interesting ones to Someone asked the question, would a revocable trust transfer financial accounts easier than accounts with a payable on death or beneficiary. And um, while I am not an attorney, I don't think that that element, like I don't think that's why you would want to get a trust specifically to pass accounts easier, unless you had a bunch of beneficiaries, <laughs> um, which around my area, we serve a lot of Amish and Mennonite clients. And so there can be rather large families and many beneficiaries on, um, those IRAs or whatever. But yeah, I think an underutilized good thing for your estate is just adding a transfer on death designation to your individual or joint account that you have. Um, just keeps things easy, keeps it out of the estate, keeps it private, um, but also doesn't incur the cost of a trust. Now, there are other reasons to have trusts. And I've also considered um, having a friend of mine who's an attorney come on this channel and talk through kind of the trust dis discussion uh, from the woman's perspective, because she works for an all women's firm as well. And if that's of interest to you, tell me in the comments below. All right, that's all I've got from there. Checking back one more time on the live stream and the comments therein. Oh, Mary Kessler. Can you go back a little bit on the long term care? I wasn't here for that. And also, what are the normal costs for setting up trusts? <coughs> Um, I think just quick on the trusts, I don't know enough about, I, I don't know enough about the legal fees that's going to change from firm to firm. I would expect no less than $3,000, but I could be wrong. Um, and also I'm in the Midwest. So if you're on the coasts, those costs for trust might be different than they are here in the Midwest, but long-term care. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about it a little bit more. And if you can Mary Joanne, um, Paula, whoever else is with me today, if you want to ask some specific questions about long-term care, that is helpful for me just to answer it rather than kind of like shoot from the hip and, uh, say whatever is that comes to my mind. But, um, long-term care insurance, obviously if you have a history, if you have, um, like lineage that shows that you could possibly need a nursing home. Yes, it would be worth 
um, digging into the costs of long-term care insurance. It's of, often quite expensive. So even there are, this might be helpful. There's three different types of long-term care insurance that you can purchase. One is traditional and it's use it or lose it. So think of it as equivalent to your, dry, to your car insurance. Um, with your car insurance, you only use it when you get in an accident. Otherwise you're just paying for it over time. Uh, granted, it's not very expensive. With long-term care insurance, the traditional way of buying it was a use it or lose it scenario, where if you didn't end up needing it, that cost went poof. And oh, by the way, that's like $5,000 a year that you were just spending with bump ups in the cost year over year, depending on the insurance company's premiums. So not ideal, but that is one way to purchase long-term care insurance. It will be the least expensive in the short term, but anticipate with those traditional policies that the costs will increase over time, the premium will increase over time as the healthcare costs continue to increase. I think healthcare costs tend to increase by like 6% annually. Um, so that premium that you're spending today might be quite different in the future. And so if you're using, like if I am doing a financial plan with someone and we're budgeting out what their retirement income will be, and long-term care insurance with the traditional long-term care insurance is a factor of that, um, it might end up being that that element ends up uh, disrupting income later because of the cost becoming so substantial and should I keep it or not? And if we end up having to drop it, then what was the point of purchasing it altogether? You asked, so they always go up, the premiums? Um, not always. So what an insurance company does, they can only increase premiums. So this, again, we're just talking about the traditional long-term care insurance. There are other versions of this. Um, and just like your home and auto insurance, occasionally it will increase the cost. The premiums will increase. And that is done on a, uh, like the insurance company can't do it to just to you individually, but they can do it to the band of people to whom it applies. So someone in your age range, they've got a bunch of people who have this long-term care insurance and they can increase that cost. So if you don't like that, which I mean, who would? Nobody likes increased costs of things. Um, then looking at other options for long-term care might be more beneficial to you. And so there's, there's so much innovation coming out with long-term care insurance because there's a higher need because women are stepping into the driver's seat with their finances and making more of these decisions. All good. But um, so there are, you can get life insurance policies that have a long-term care rider on it. So if you're fairly healthy and you're young enough and you qualify, you can do that. Um, these would be permanent policies that get put in place that have a cash value that end up paying out towards long-term care insurance. Um, so that's one option. And then there are annuities. So if you happen to be someone who purchased an annuity that's kind of gotten locked up where it's, it was not a retirement account, it was not an IRA, it was a non-qualified annuity. And let's say the cost basis was 50,000, that annuity has grown to 200,000. And if you take any money out, it's completely taxable. There are options to use that annuity for, um, a long-term care policy, but it doesn't get great leverage. It's just if it's like, I don't know, it's kind of like a Hail Mary to me <laughs> of like, I want to get some sort of long term care insurance in place and I have this asset. It could work. Maybe I'll do that. Um, but there again, you're weighing the need for that annuity in that scenario to go towards your income needs versus um, long term care insurance. So that's another f form of long term care. And then there are long term care policies that build a cash value themselves. You can, um, you can purchase them and maybe say, I'm gonna pay in for 20 years and maybe I'm gonna pay a much higher premium than I would if I did the use it or lose it traditional long-term care insurance. <clears throat> so let's say, and these are me just pulling numbers out of the air. These are not quotes, <laughs> so don't use them as quotes. But uh, let's say that the traditional long-term care policy costs $7,000 every year. Um, but you wanted to do, you didn't like that option. So you wanted to do the, the long-term care insurance that, uh, builds a cash value and you only pay for a certain amount of time. Um, and you get a certain pool of benefits. Then 
you might be spending like $15,000 for a shorter period of time, but then it stops. Or I mean, you can structure the payments so differently. So I don't want to land on payments where I should really land is the benefits. And so in that um, pool of benefits, it might say that I get uh, X number of dollars towards care needs, whether that's in a nursing home or at my home. So long as I meet two activities of daily living and once that pool is used up, then I'm, I have no more long-term care insurance and you structure that pool based on the need that you want, the need that you might have. So it might be that I want that pool to last for two years, or I want that pool to last for three years, or I want that pool to last the entire time that I'm alive. That will be crazy expensive, but um, you can structure them differently. So it's really important if this is a consideration that you are ready to look at, to um, talk to someone who's a long-term care insurance specialist that can help you walk through the decisions um, because it's very nuanced. It really is. And it's an expensive purchase and one that uh, is not easily unwound. And so you want to make sure you go with, with eyes open and good luck with that. <laughs> I hope that uh, that was helpful. Mary, um, if you have further questions, you're welcome to comment them below. I still have about 10 minutes on my calendar for this live stream. I'm really enjoying doing this q and I anticipate doing more of these in the future. Um, but if there are no other questions, then I'll conclude early. Good. Glad it was helpful, Mary. Thank you for being here also. It's also just nice to have a little back and forth with someone rather than just talking to a camera, which I do a lot, but you know, I prefer conversation. Naturally, pleasant financial conversations. So. Cool. Well, um, while I'm waiting for any more questions to come in, I will um, just talk a little bit about me and kind of where I'm at in my year and what that means for you on this um, pleasant financial conversations. So I'm in the middle of my review season, which means that I'm spending a lot of times in a lot of time in meetings with clients and less time being available here on this channel. Um, and I really enjoyed doing the mindful money walk through last month with those different posts to, to just talk about like, why is it that I believe what I believe about money? And um, as you stick around here on Pleasant Financial Conversations, you'll see that the lens that I bring to the financial conversation is really a little tie-in of behavior psychology into personal finance. So um, yes, I am technically trained, but I find that information to be helpful to an extent often I find it more impactful to be able to help people understand why it is that they're wanting to make the decisions that they want to about money. Okay. Um, oh, so all of that to say, uh, I will be more present here in the next, you know, once May rolls around, um, I've got some good plans in order and you'll be hearing more from me. And I'm hoping this is, this is my first attempt at a live stream where I'm actually talking about financial stuff. Um, I did a couple of live streams earlier this year and they were more on like the turn of the new year and mindset and goal setting and things like that. Um, as I'm continuing to work with my legal team, just making sure that everything looks good. I'm interested to see how this lands, not only for you, but for them. So, all right, more questions. Saving. Okay. So maybe saving for it, assisted living, maybe a way and small policy for possible long-term care. So long-term care insurance can be used for assisted living so long as you do need that, those, you have at least two activities of daily living that you're not able to um, complete. So that's transferring from bed to chair, transferring, feeding or eating, um, feeding yourself, toileting, uh, bathing, and there's two more, and anyway, <laughs> um, dressing, and then there's one more, but as long as you don't have one of those two, some of these newer policies that are coming out are fascinating to me because they are helping pay out to, to help you accomplish some of the other things around the home. So maybe if you're, um, if you have a relative, a niece, um, a child, a, a sibling that's coming to help you, 
um, as you, you have some of these care needs because you can't meet those two activities of daily living, it might pay for something else. So it might be someone to mow your lawn um, or to keep up with something around your home. But I just wanted to make that clarification, depending on the life, the long-term care policy that you buy, you might still be able to pay for some of assisted living with it. Um, yes, this will be available for later viewing for sure. Self-insure and then there's I'm trying to keep up here, but the likelihood of that happening is kind of slim or at the end of one's life. It's going to happen. But normal costs today are no less than 3000 to 5000 a month. Yeah. So long-term care facilities are expensive <laughs> for sure. 3000 to 5000 a month is that I imagine you're talking about assisted living. I've heard um, like full nursing home is at least in Ohio is more like $7,000 a month. And in, on the coasts, it might be more like 10 to 15, depending um, it's expensive. So, all right. Well, friends, it's been a delight to be with you today. I hope you are well, um, as we are continuing through the realities of the world. And I'm looking forward to continuing the financial conversations as you engage on pleasant financial conversations. I hope you'll be open to asking those questions kind of in a public area for everybody to comment on as you have them. Um, I really value the space for women to learn from each other. Um, and I, there's something that feels safer for a lot of women to just know that they're not our male counterparts in the room. And we can ask the, what I hear people say are dumb questions. They're not actually dumb questions. They're very good questions. Um, you just haven't had the opportunity to ask the questions that have been top of mind. So, um, all right, have a great day. Nice to see you. And we'll, we'll talk soon.